Hello, everybody. Good morning. My name is Aaron Myers. Uh, I work for the Aspen Institute. Welcome. Uh, it's lovely out, of course. And we're all here for news at the speed of data. I'm a voracious consumer of news. You probably are, too. There has not been a better time to, to be in that situation due largely to some of the folks up here with us today. And I think we're going to have uh, a very interesting session uh, ahead of us. It's going to be moderated today by Vivian Schiller, who's head of news at Twitter. And um, I'm happy to give that to you to take it away. But one quick housekeeping note, folks. Uh, your phones, please turn them to the uh, vibrate position. And feel free to use them during today's event, because we'd love to have you using the hashtag Aspen Ideas tag that you're familiar with. Thank you very much. OK, thanks so much, Aaron. Actually, I'm very specifically going to ask you to make sure you have your phones handy, because we're going to do a little experiment in a second. Um, thank you uh, all for being here early. I'm going to start. We have a lot to get into, so I'm going to jump right in. Um, I want to start by introducing um, our panelists. We have really a terrific set of panels, panelists. Uh, immediately to my left is Ted Bailey, who's the founder and CEO of Data Miner, which is a very interesting um, tech company whose name says it all, and you'll hear more uh, about what that's about from Ted in a minute. His Twitter handle is at Ted Bailey, T-E-D-B-A-I-L-E-Y. Um, next is Isaac Lee, who is the president of news for Univision, or I should say Univ Univision, Univision. <laughs> and the uh, CEO of uh, Fusion, which is a very cool uh, upstart cable network that I think is, is, is already poised to do amazing things. Uh, next is uh, Chris Alchek, who is the CEO and co-founder of Mike, formerly known as Policy Mike. Um, it is, if you saw, if you were at the panel yesterday morning at the Jerome, you heard a little bit about Mike. It's really uh, a wonderful digital property aimed at uh, 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 news for uh, millennials. And then uh, finally, Jim Bankoff, who is the chairman and CEO of Vox Media, which is a collection of really extraordinary digital properties many of which you probably know, SB Nation, which has been pretty popular in recent days, um, The Verge about technology and culture, Polygon about gaming, Eater about food and dining, Curbed home and real estate, Racked about shopping, and then most recently, uh, Vox, uh, which is a cool uh, data-driven explainer news organization. I didn't uh, probably explain it that well, but you'll do better than that. But we're going to start with an experiment, and this is why I wanted you to have your phones out. So um, with apologies to Ellen DeGeneres, um, I'm going to send a tweet with a selfie, so I'm going to ask the panelists to stand up, and I'm going to ask you to have your phones out. Um, my Twitter handle is at Vivian, so we're going to take a picture. You're going to be part of it. I am the world's worst photographer, I probably should say. So we're going to uh, try to do this, not get the lights. Sorry. Okay, I want to get people in the background. Uh, hold on. Uh, okay, terrible, terrible picture, and there. I'm there, I'm there, I'm there. All right, I'm <laughs> sending it, and use photo, and I'm going to tweet it, and I'm going to ask um, all of you in the audience, and for those of you that may be watching us on a live stream, I think we're live streamed, Aaron, aren't we, yeah. um, to find that tweet and please uh, retweet it or favorite it or retweet it and favorite it. You can respond to it. You can do whatever you want to get my, um, it came from my Twitter account, which is at Vivian. So uh, if you want to follow me along the way, that's fine. <laughs> and um, the tweet, let me just tell you as you're finding it what the tweet says, because it gets to the purpose of this panel. It says, every tweet is data that tells a story. Please retweet to spread the news. And it's got our selfie with the hashtag Aspen Ideas. And it's geolocated to, I got to turn my phone off because it looks like this is all happening now, which is great. Um, <laughs> and it's, it yeah, hashtags <laughs> to Aspen Ideas. And this tweet and your retweets, your favorites, your replies, these are part of over 500 million tweets that are sent daily. Collectively and individually, those 500 million tweets represent one of the greatest public real time data sets ever known. It is inside that data set is everything that you can imagine. It is geopolitical events, the beginnings, middles, and sometimes the ends of geopolitical events. There's shifts in public opinion. There's, hum there's humor. There's heartbreak. There's everything that you can imagine in those tweets. It's just a matter of being able to find them. And while all of you individually obviously couldn't possibly consume those 500 million uh, tweets a day, 
news organizations increasingly can. And that's had a profound impact on um, the way that news is discovered and distributed and reported upon. And that's a lot of what we're going to talk about today. So our little tweet experiment will be found by someone and maybe written about as an experiment that happened here at Aspen Ideas. Uh, we'll check on that a little bit later. But um, the other thing about those 500 million tweets is inside of those, uh, inside of that data set. And don't forget, for Twitter, it's live and it's public. Every tweet, all of these tweets we sent are available to anybody in the world. But those live tweets inside, of those, those, that data has turned over the natural order of the way individuals, journalists, consumers, and governments sometimes spread the news and get the news. And I want to show a very specific example about a breaking news incident. If we can pull the slide up now. Um, this guy, his name is uh, Soheb Afthar. I know I'm always pronouncing it right. He is a uh, IT consultant who lives in Pakistan. And uh, in the morning, uh, 1 AM on uh, May 1st, 2011, Sorry, this, this guy who was lying awake sent this tweet. And uh, as you can see, it says, helicopters hovering above Abbottabad at 1 AM is a very rare event. That, right. So this is pretty profound. Now, a, quite a number of hours later, this tweet went out from the White House, from Dan Pfeiffer, who's communications director. There we go. POTUS is to address the nation tonight at 10.30 PM Eastern time. Very mysterious. This is the White House trying to control the message, which is what they have done for centuries. But before the president, so first of all, we had an eyewitness sending a tweet about the helicopters. We have the president saying, we're going to give you this news hours and hours from now. But before he got a chance to speak to the American people, this tweet came out. Sorry, I'm having. Uh, this is from Keith Urban, who's a 27-year-old uh, chief of staff for former Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld. Yeah, oops. Uh, so I'm told by a um, reputable person that we have killed Osama bin Laden. Hot damn. So this is completely inverted the way things have always been. Think about how this would have happened before a live public platform like Twitter. The White House would have controlled the message. Uh, from there, you know, even if Keith had wanted to leak it, he would have had to track down a journalist. He couldn't have shared it so broadly. Uh, our IT consultant in Abbottabad might have been found, you know, much later after all the news had been announced by the White House as an eyewitness. The thing about this is this feels very dramatic, and this was a particularly dramatic news event, but this happens many, many, many times a day. And we're going to talk, Ted's going to talk about more in a minute. So um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of sense in this open of the power of this data um, and the impact it has, again, on the news industry and on you. And um, we're going to hear a little bit from Ted about that data, but mostly I want to hear from the journalists who, for whom that data is having an impact and, to my mind, creating sort of a new, a, 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 a revolution in a very positive way in uh, news gathering and journalism. Um, before I do, I want to just set up one framework, because I think it's a way that can help us understand um, the context of the profound impact Twitter and other uh, social media platforms are having on news. Um, this is a little, I'm having a little problem with the clicker here. Um, this is something um, I, I call the Twitter news compass there, it says up front. And um, just briefly, just to give you sort of a sense of a framework of how we think about it, um, this is roughly represents the way news organizations have told us they interact with Twitter in the, in the, in the, in the process of doing what news organizations do. So very quickly, at the top is detect, is what we just talked about. In those 500 million tweets, what are the news? What are the trends? What are the shifts of public opinion? You know, what is the next Syria, the next Ukraine, the next uh, Egypt, what have you? Then as you move around to the uh, eastern part of the compass report, this is once the news has been detected, this is news organizations using that open live platform to connect with eyewitnesses, to find sources, to verify that information is true. Because anybody can send about it, tweet about anything. We need news organizations to do the digging and the work to see that it's true. At the bottom is distribute. This is the way that news organizations share stories, telling stories in new and unique ways. We'll talk more about it. And then finally, on the western part of the compass, engage. This is the very act of the audience, or as Jay Rosen calls, the people formerly known as the audience, are, are involved with the very act of the news process. They are, they are opining. They are sharing information. They are sometimes correcting. And it is a way for news organizations and the public 
to be in a multi-directional constant conversation as opposed to the, you know, here's your morning newspaper, see you tomorrow, uh, the way that, uh, the way things used to be. And those, of course, those very same people in the act of engaging are the ones from whom news is then detected. So you can see how it comes full circle. Um, so I want to uh, now throw it to Ted Bailey, who's going to talk about mostly about sort of the, I guess you would say the, the, the northern and the eastern part of that compass, <laughs> and how, the, how that data is impacting the work that journalists do. Thanks, Vivian. Um, so when we did that little experiment at the beginning, um, you know, you guys, a set of you probably retweeted it out, and a set of your followers probably saw the tweet itself, and you know, from that point on, it probably started to pass across the digital landscape. While individuals that are using Twitter see these tweets themselves um, you know, in their timeline, a company like Dataminer, which is, is, is my company, which takes in the whole uh, fire hose of tweets in real time and watches the aggregate patterns across that whole collective, sees data, not individual tweets. So to give some context on sort of what I mean by that, what, what is the data of a tweet? If you think specifically about that selfie, just from a data perspective, forget it from the perspective of you as a consumer actually seeing a tweet, that bit of information um, was published. Um, in a very short period of time, it got a very abnormal uptick in activity across the hopefully. Twitter platform. Yeah, hopefully. Uh, hopefully. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> even, if, even if there were, uh, well, I mean, hopefully you guys could uh, take advantage of that, you know, change that right now. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it also had a geolocation attached to it, which Vivian uh, uh, elected to make public. Uh, potentially some of you who are in the audience also had a geolocation attached to it. So this, a this activity actually had a geo proximity to it. So across the whole constellation of tweets, this was actually somewhat of a shooting star in terms of it you know, getting traction and, and, and behaving across the collective in a very abnormal way. And those types of micro patterns are what essentially data miner, uh, my, my company does. We're the first real-time information discovery company. Um, we started out in the financial services industry, essentially delivering early information to Wall Street, hedge funds and investment banks. Um, we moved on to the public sector, um, helping emergency responders essentially get information first to save lives. And then uh, we, we came into the news space about six months ago um, and have now been deploying our, our product out to a number of news organizations as we develop it around these particular use cases. And, and what I want to show you are, uh, is essentially what, what Vivian said, is that you know, many people are familiar with these iconic Twitter moments, um, o Osama bin Laden, or you know, when the plane went down in the Hudson, everyone's, you know, many people in New York saw it and, and retweeted it. But what, what people often fail to realize is that you know, the, the quote unquote plane on the Hudson moment really happens every day, if not many times a day, where individuals around the world equipped with Twitter um, have their cell phones, see and experience the world around them, and are that front line of information uh, the first to report anything. Essentially, the 250 uh, million uh, people plus on Twitter are essentially a, a global sensor network that's out there detecting information. So here you see a slide of just one day in the life of Twitter. And you have a diverse set of things being broken first on Twitter from on the light side, um, a, the actress Amy Adams deciding to give up her seat to um, uh, essentially a, a, a former a, a, a vet um, from uh, the military, which became a, a PR event. And, and someone saw that on the plane and tweeted about it, um, to actually a plane going down, uh, the, the example in the middle. Um, to a tragic explosion in the middle of Nigeria where there's a lot of conflict, um, to a, a blackout that caused turmoil in Caracas, to a tornado in Colorado. Um, and when these things happen unexpectedly around the world, it is just Twitter that's on the front line with people um, you know, articulating the world they see around them, what they hear, what they feel, what they think. And that data set uh, worldwide is, is unparalleled. You know, Vivian said in, in her opening, you know, it's, it's a shift that you know, is sort of similar to uh, the printing press. I mean, you can see why. This is a real-time information network where the people themselves, you, are the front line. If you go to the next slide and see if the clicker works for me, this is just one more example. So not only are people uh, around the world in unexpected places, um, or, or rather in places where unexpected events happen, in the middle of a conflict like this, 
um, where it's very dangerous for reporters to operate, citizens are out there tweeting what they're seeing. So here you have a citizen uh, first tweeting when um, the conflict first broke out in Iraq in, in Mosul, and that was a whole 12 hours ahead of any news coverage, and I'll come back to that, um, that sort of time difference and what it means. Then you have when essentially the citizens fleed Mosul, uh, people tweeting about that, and then ultimately when the forces themselves left the city, uh, again, um, that was uh, first on Twitter. Now, when you think about you know, what these signals actually mean, it's important to understand that these aren't news. What these are essentially are pieces of a puzzle, clues, that can give a journalist a way to start their process, that can give a journalist a way to start forming the mosaic that will be their story. And that early warning, that, that citizen on the ground, that eyewitness, and connecting them with the right journalist at the right time, is, is what we specialize in, and really sort of how to make this data set, as Vivian said, um, you know, truly useful. Um, I think that the last thing, you know, before I pass it on to the journalists who really have much more business talking about this than I do, um, the last thing I want um, to hit o over the head on is that often people, when they think about Twitter and they think about social media, they think, well, okay, I hear you, there are these moments, but, but it's unreliable. How do I possibly know if, if this is real or not? Anyone could tweet anything at any time. You know, I, am I really going to make a decision on top of this data? And one of the things that we at DataMiner really have spent a lot of time uh, thinking about and writing algorithms to uh, detect is that in Twitter itself are patterns which can be incredibly helpful at verifying information and, and at contextualizing information. So for example, when this explosion happened in Harlem, of course there, there was a citizen who saw it and tweeted about it. If you move ahead minutes later, you have a cluster of activity in one location um, that's from disparate sources who don't know each other and don't overlap on, on the Twitter network. And that pattern, those dots that create that, you know, essentially, uh, you know, a, a data image of the scene, show a really compelling picture that this is real. This actually is happening. So often, Twitter itself is one of the, and Twitter data is one of the most powerful means for verifying itself and events that happen in the world. And you know, I think that that's something that is overlooked and, and one of the real rich, powerful. Uh, ways that journalists can use the data set. So with that, I yeah. hand it over Thanks. to. Well, I'll throw this to. Uh, oh, okay. a couple of questions. Okay. So, um, so you can. So the the next we now want to move on to what is the impact this has on news organizations and on you, the consumer. So I want to start, Jim. I'm going to start with you, and say what is what is the availability of all of this data, wherever it may come from. How, how does that impact the way that your newsroom operates? How does that impact what it means to be a journalist? How they're trained? How they go about their jobs? Well. Whether it's Twitter or other data sources that are available to us, it's, it's certainly become part of the process. You know, all parts of the compass that you laid out are part of the modern newsroom. And you know, at Vox Media, we both build tools to help storytellers take advantage of the new sources of data um, and then in the new distribution methods. Uh, and we also hire people who you can call it web native or people who really understand how to weave, how to use these new sources of, of innovation to tell, ultimately tell better stories, to inform and engage their audiences better. And while we embrace it, ultimately it comes down to basic principles which were adhered to uh, even prior to the digital revolution, principles of telling the truth, of good storytelling, of engaging audiences. So these are tools which can be used to enhance those basic principles. And we, um, we put a particular emphasis, again, on hiring the right people and then enabling them with the right infrastructure to do it. And I think it manifests itself in, in a couple ways. First is new storytelling formats. Um, and I can walk you through. I have some live examples of uh, some of those. Um, but then secondly, the application of those formats. So. Um, I'll, I'll preface this by saying a lot of the, you know, if we're talking about what has changed, one thing that has changed is the medium is obviously different. Um, and in the early stages of the internet, frankly, you know, until very recently, I think we had been publishing 
articles the same way a newspaper or a magazine had been publishing articles. And the same goes for video. We would just take the asset, as it were, the piece of content, and put it on the web. And we developed things like content management systems in order to do that. Uh, but if you stop to think about it, why is a newspaper format, a newspaper article format relevant in a digital world? It was produced originally for the constraints of a physical newspaper and for the, you know, the desire and the need to inform the audience within those constraints. Well, those constraints have changed, they've been blown up. And so that allows storytellers to communicate with their audience in entirely new ways and to use the data to inform them on exactly how they should be doing it. So rather than talk about it, why don't I just give you a few examples? And if we can just go to the first slide. This is from one of our, the first website. This is from our site, The Verge. And, and maybe if you just scroll up to give a little context. Um, this, this is a, a a format that we developed called the story stream. And the story stream enables a journalist, an online storyteller, to basically have a reverse chronological update on any topic, any news topic that's going on. Every news story, of course, has an arc. The arc might be several years or it might be s several minutes. Um, but what we were finding is that the old format didn't allow for us to kind of give updates. There's this saying that uh, you know, every news is, is breaking news, every, news can, every piece of news can, has continual updates. So we developed a format to help us with that. This happens to be from last week um, at the Google I.O. conference. And so these are about 30-something updates that our journalists put together. They were covering the event live. They have subject matter expertise. But in an old newspaper format, you would have to repeat the first few paragraphs to give the reader context. You don't have to do that online. Uh, there are new ways of expressing yourself. So if you were to click into any one of these, and if we go to the next tab, you'll see this happens to be um, you know, something that get, is pretty popular, uh, iPhone or Android, uh, coming out of the conference and kind of a reflective piece. So you can click in, you can go deep on anything that you want to. If you already know some of the news, you can skip through that and go directly to what you care about. And even as you go through this article, you can see how we present it in a multimedia way. We embed tweets, we embed videos, et cetera. Another one of our sites, Vox, which is our general news site, and it has the mission of explaining the news, helping the reader to understand the news, uses a different format that we invented to help with its mission. We call this a card stack. This one happens to be about the um, child and family migrant crisis. And as you can see, and this actually works even better on a mobile phone since about half of our audience is now on mobile. On mobile, here you just swipe through these cards and you quickly get up to speed on the topic. Uh, and it, and it, you know, all of us are busy people. We all, you know, I think by definition, if you're in this crowd, you're someone who strives to be informed, yet with the speed of information, it's a difficult thing. So another challenge with all the data coming at us is for journalists is how do we help our audience make sense of it, provide the right context, the right understanding. Um, and while we might all be informed people, it's hard for us to be informed on every topic all the time. So rather than only give the latest update, which is what newspapers and, and television broadcasts had done, only telling us the newest thing and then cramming in a little bit of context into that article, we can go back now, give you the latest update, but then guide you to a full explainer that's formatted in a very intuitive way so that you can quickly come up to speed as much or as little as you need to on any given topic. This is just one of several types of formats um, that we use to help explain the news. If we go to the next tab, just another very quick example of, you know, this stuff doesn't have to be uh, rocket science, although like we put a lot of emphasis, we have a technology team of about 68 people or so that focuses on design, focuses on technology to help our storytellers and our advertisers for that matter to tell better stories. This was just a quick hack that one of our developers put together in one night. We had a great interview with Timothy Geithner, but it was 48 minutes long and we recognized that the digital medium it's hard for someone to sit through a 48-minute interview, even with a compelling subject like uh, Tim talking about the economy. So we quickly just put together this interactive table of contacts, 
and um, within a night you can just quickly go to the pieces that you want to. It shows you exactly how long it's going to be, so you know uh, you, you can scroll through. Yeah. Yes, and there's a great one about Dinesh D'Souza there. Uh, I guess they were. I guess they were college uh, classmates, and uh, they came to blows at one point. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. uh, it, these are a, a variety of uh, examples of how we try to m give the audience context with this barrage of data. And it's really, I think, the role of the modern day storyteller to be able to use the data to inform and engage audience. It's the role of the um, product organization and the and the, and the storytellers to come together to use technology and journalism to engage their audience in new ways. So the interesting thing here, of course, is not only are you taking this data and putting context around it and making it more sense, but you're actually using individual pieces of data, whether they're tweets or Instagram photos or what have you, inside your stories. It's a sort of a feedback loop in that's, a way. That's exactly yeah. right. And it's such a rich, you, you started off by saying there's, you know, I think there's never been a better time to be a consumer of news information because of that. Yeah. So I want to, um, Isaac, I want to turn it over to you. Uh, you. You were at the center of one of the biggest uh, global news events that's happening uh, on the planet today, which is the World Cup, and, and Univision is the global Spanish language uh, broadcaster. And I so, should be there. Yeah, I know you should be there. We're very <laughs> grateful for you to be here in Aspen. I want to just show if you could just pull up that quick uh, that quick slide. This is uh, the game, the tragic, the tragic, tragic. Uh, loss uh, hmm. yesterday, USA loss. Uh, this just gives you a sense of the kind of conversations, the spikes that you see um, around particular moments of the game. But, but Isaac, I know you you have sp spent uh, probably well over a year or more preparing for the games and figuring out how to way how to, uh, ways to take the pulse of the public through social media, through publicly available data. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, when when there is an event like the World Cup, what what we have to do is think what is the second screen experience that we can give the people that are going to be watching. So you have live the soccer game and, and nothing is better than to watch it on television. But if you, if you have something like we did for, for Fusion, um, which was uh, put together like a honeycomb of, of things that were happening on real time that you were taking of the pictures, the videos, the tweets that were, happening, that were happening in the stadium there. So you knew what they were talking about the game right there. Um, you can actually see where a person is sitting, how close they are from where they took the picture, which celebrity is sitting next to who. But it, it also uh, enriches the, the experience so you can be watching the game uh, on television and then having um, uh, additional data information, uh, making it exciting, gossipy, uh, giving them what, what they cannot see on real time on television. And for us, the World Cup is huge. I mean, it's a, it's a festival that uh, takes 31 days and our ratings and our numbers go to the sky. And, and uh, we are very focused on producing all the content that can surround that in a positive way. So if one soccer player uh, uh, scores a goal, we are going to have there everything about the soccer player, uh, who he is, where he plays, how much is his uh, you know, uh, pass worth, um, where is he going to play next, how many goals he scored. All of that you can watch while watching the game as well. And how is the, the conversation, the public conversation that's happening on Twitter and elsewhere, how is that informing? I mean, you're monitoring that. You're watching that carefully. How does that inform your coverage? Well, it, it, it tells you how the fans are seeing the game and, and what's happening inside the stadium. So um, it is very exciting. And it also shows you what are the um, experts that know about soccer are writing, what is their opinion, what's going on with the game, if they're going to classify or not, and, and who is this soccer player that just got in, um, why they're making that change. It gives you all types of info that, that you wouldn't have if you don't have all this real-time access. Right. Chris, I want to uh, turn in to you and let's talk a little bit about um, Mike, which is you know, specifically focused at a, at a millennial audience, and these are digital, mostly digital natives who have grown up and have a certain expectation about the way the, work, the world works and that two-way, multi-directional conversation. How does that impact the way that you 
engage with your audiences across all of the platform and the kind of data that, that those audiences represent? Yeah, I mean, for us, it's, it's really interesting. Our main first distribution channel are now social. So Facebook and Twitter is where our audience finds the news, uh, which is a fundamentally different thing than a, a flat website or a newspaper or a magazine. And our audience expects to be able to engage. And what that means for us and we think the future of journalism is, is it's still about telling really important stories and explaining the world. Uh, but now you have to listen to what people are saying and, and incorporate those ideas into your, into your point of view, uh, positively or negatively. Uh, and you actually have to actively campaign uh, to get your word out there. Uh, and so you'll see a lot of times now the best journalists uh, taking this more activist role to really push their message and respond to every tweet that comes back, respond to every Facebook message, uh, and make sure that their opinion is, is touching the masses. Uh, and it's, it's a very different thing than saying, okay, write my story, publish, and it's over. Now that's only half the battle. You sort of write your story, you publish, uh, and then you're involved in this global conversation, sometimes for a week or two weeks afterwards. And how have we, what have you learned about what works, what resonates in that, uh, in that conversation? And I should point out, uh, there's a really interesting quiz in the New York Times, uh, The Upshot, this morning, where it's a, which I will not reveal my score, because uh, <laughs> uh, it's a quiz about what tweets, uh, you go through 25 questions of what tweets work best, what got retweeted or favored, favorited most. And it's very interesting because there are many learnings about when engaging with audiences. We know, for example, the reason I took a, the photograph with the tweet that we sent this morning is that when there is an image, that gets uh, much more engagement. So what have you learned about how to engage with audiences through all social platforms? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So I, maybe it's best to just take a look at an example. If you want to pull up um, the Ukraine story, uh, you know, as we all know, Ukraine revolution has been a huge topic of conversation. Um, and one of the questions that we always have to answer is, OK, how do we take this, this complicated, distant topic and make it real uh, for 20-somethings in the US? Uh, and so in this case, uh, one, of our, one of our editors went through Instagram profiles of uh, hundreds of Ukrainian citizens and did a, bo a before and after uh, using multimedia that's crowdsourced from Ukraine, from Instagram, and packaging it and telling a story uh, in a way that really explains the crisis in, in a very human way. Uh, and so this is one example where images are, are both taken from the ground, verified, uh, and then uh, talked about in a really human way that uh, anybody can understand. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. These are very, you know, there's a, there's a lot of serious news happening. Um, all over the world, of course. But some of the interesting thing in the data that Ted, you you know, you mentioned in your presentation, is some of the some of the sort of softer or feature stories. That, and it's fascinating to see what resonates. I mean, it's almost holding up a, a mirror to our culture to see what is it that we care about that we want to share. For instance, something that's touching, like Amy Amy Adams giving up her uh, first class seat to uh, to uh, to a serviceman. What are some of the other things that you've seen that are sort of in the softer news that have resonated, and particularly ones that have surprised you? Well, I mean, I, you know, I, one of the benefits of Aspen Ideas is that you get to talk to uh, you know, many of the leaders uh, across the world in, in, in many different functions. And I had a very interesting conversation with uh, Tony Blair. And I asked him, you know, what do you think of Twitter? Um, and he said, you know, it, it's revolutionized politics. And essentially, it's not just about communicating with the public. Uh, but it's about when there's a tweet uh, published, the reaction that the public has not only guides sort of our messaging, but can actually guide policy, can actually guide our actions as a government because of that call and response nature of social media. And a great example of this is the, the, the tragic um, bring back your girls hashtag, which you know is kind of on the it's feature, but it's, it's serious in that that trended and ultimately became something uh, with social media, became a much more widespread story. And ultimately, there was action taken. And, and the situation is being addressed and focused on more as a result of, of social making it a story. And um, you know, it's not just breaking information on Twitter. It's really that you know, uh, it's, it's like a real-time voting system for something that's interesting, quirky, and it's a, it's a wonderful quality of the data set. And, you know, something that the news cycle and, and the news and journalists have such an incredibly interwoven active part in. Yeah, um, and the uh, Yahoo News actually reported this about a month ago that the White House uh, monitors 
uh, journalist Twitter handles and is sending out summaries of all those tweets uh, sometimes hundreds of times per day, and, and actually actively reaching out to journalists before they publish, uh, before they publish anything. And so it's, it's you know, flipped political communication and a lot of general media communication on its head, both in the way journalists, act, journalists operate and, and politicians and policymakers operate. But that raises another interesting issue, which I'll throw to any three of, the, uh, of our uh, news leaders here, which is with Break, when news breaks, because of your work, because of others' work, there's a good chance before anybody comes to you, they're going to be aware of the headline. There's, it's no longer that you, you know, again, the, the classic old-fashioned example that you pick up the New York Times in the morning to see what happened or you wait till 6.30 to watch Brian Williams tell you. How does that tell you what, what's going on? How does that impact the way that you think about what you present to the audience? Because you, you, you must have a presupposition that people know the headline. So how does that change what you do? Any of you? Yeah. Happy to. I so I think it's an important point. And while I think you know, we're all companies that have been enabled by these trends, there's also perils for journalists and perils for the newsroom to avoid, I think. One is, related to your question, Vivian, is uh, being part of the echo chamber. Uh, and just you know, someone else breaks news. There's a lot of talk. You see it trending in Twitter. A lot of modern newsrooms feel the need to write about it just because everyone's talking about it. Yet. Uh, you know, I think we all like to hold ourselves to a bar that unless we have something to contribute to the conversation, and sometimes it's not original reporting, uh, but sometimes it is a unique perspective. Sometimes, um, you know, in the sports world, for instance, with our site SB Nation, it can often be either satirical or it could be analytical. It's always, you know, it, it, it's a derivative of the thing itself. And so one thing to answer your question, I think it's important is to not just echo something that's already been said. And you know, we've talked about different ways to tell the story, but ultimately, you have to have voice, you have to have unique perspective. The other peril I see with some of our uh, journalists who have Twitter up all day is that uh, it's a real-time feedback mechanism for what their audience is and, frankly, what their peers are saying about them. And often, uh, it's human nature to you know, want that feedback immediately, and if your peers are Poke, taking shots at you, or you know, let's say that you position something in a more mainstream way. There's a lot of snark on Twitter, of course, and you know. So yeah. I think it's also healthy to be able to put the Twitter away, uh, close the <laughs> close the tweet deck, uh, and you know, really have the conviction of the stories that you're telling and understanding what what the mainstream audience is thinking um, and going beyond what your peer group might be thinking as well. Um, we're going to throw it open to uh, questions for the audience. Um, I'm going to ask one more question, so get uh, myself, and then so, but get ready. Isaac, I want to come back to you and talk a little bit about you are, uh, in, with your Spanish language services, you're in many countries and you're also in many different communities. What are the, what are the interesting um, differences that you see across social media in different Spanish-speaking like Spanish communities? It's unbelievable how much um, Hispanics over-index in everything that is related to mobile and social media. Uh, they are hyper-connected. Um, so, so they are a great market um, for mobile phone companies and for all kinds of brands that, that uh, want to live in social media. But, but it also gives us a lot of information and data on, on what's happening with them and what is interesting to them and, and how they are behaving. Um, I don't think we cannot talk about data journalism anymore. I think that data needs to be a part of every journalist and every story. It's just that those tools were not available before, but now they need to become a part of life. And, 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 and the audience, the public, should demand us, as journalists, that we give them that feedback and that we include the, uh, those data points into every story. Um, because they are uh, uh, factual, they're, they're based on, um, on uh, math and, and, and trends that are real, and, and it can add value to the story. It's not going to necessarily tell you if the story is more meaningful or not. It's not going to tell you necessarily what is going to happen and how it's going to evolve, but it's going to give you a lot of elements to understand the story better. Um, and, and since the internet has made so many things uh, publicly available. There are no more secrets. 
You know, everything is out there and the access is there for journalists to go do the homework and explain it to you. And, and what has been happening is that Twitter became the way that headline news is reported. Nobody goes to the television to find out what's the latest breaking news or goes to a newspaper. You just get it. And, and, and so when they come to us, when they come to, to Vox or to Mike um, or to Fusion, they expect more from us. They expect us to, um, to give them context and to give them more information because the headline is already out there. I love what you said about data journalism should not be something off to the side. It should be integral to everything we do. And I love the line that David Leonhardt in the future of uh, journalism uh, comment that he made uh, yesterday morning. If any of you were the, at the Jerome, somebody in the audience said, you know, what, if, in a journalism program, what's the, what is something that you think is missing that must be part of any curriculum for training journalists? And he said math, <laughs> which is absolutely <laughs> true. true. Okay, yeah. we're going to throw it to the audience. And we've got, uh, we have one, one microphone going around, right? So we'll... Oh. Oh, Quinn, hello. Hello. Um, two things. We talked a lot about Twitter, but I'm curious about how much information comes through Facebook. And the other thing is the, the perils. Jim was talking about the perils <laughs> of this kind of communication. One thing, hashtag activism. Bring Back Our Girls started a big hashtag movement, but then the girls are still not back. Does that mean that people become armchair activists? And is that something we even care about? And, and the idea that the White House is mining our, our Twitter feed and they're getting to us first does not fill me with confidence as a journalist. <laughs> so these are the perils I see. Yeah. So maybe I'll, I'll, go, go, go I'll, for I'll it. answer one of the questions. So on, on the hashtag activism question, um, maybe if you want to pull up the, the, the yes all men uh, story, but uh, what we found, and so we've got about 20 million monthly readers, 80% uh, of them uh, have voted or signed a petition. Uh, and so I think the data shows, uh, at least from what we've seen, that, that the social activism that's happening on Facebook and Twitter is overwhelmingly leading to a uh, more politically engaged uh, population, especially in the youth group. I mean, in 2008 and 2012, uh, young people voted at higher rates than any time in the last 50 years in America. Um, and so this is, a, this is actually an example of a journalist taking on a more hashtag activism approach. And th this was in response to the uh, Santa Barbara shootings uh, and the misogyny associated there. Uh, one of our journalists uh, put together a campaign, Yes All Men, to show that men were standing up with the Yes All Women hashtag and showing solidarity. And then we got submissions from, uh, it was like over 100 people submitted photos on Twitter, and we put together the best nice. ones. And then that story ended up going viral. And so it was like a pretty incredible feedback loop of, of uh, telling a, a, a very important story, pushing the message, and then getting reaction from uh, your community. And it doesn't always work out you know, as well as this, but I think uh, it's very promising. And as more news organizations learn how to, um, to take advantage of these tools, you'll see much more effective communication of, of the messages that we are in the business of, of telling. Isaac, I, I, I think that we need to understand activism the way media has evolved and changed. This generation is um, into activism because there is no more monologue. Now we have a dialogue. And so they feel they want to be part of the story. They want to shape the world they are living in. And that has completely changed all the dynamics. When we were watching a newscast or we were reading a newspaper, we were receiving information. We were not interacting. And, and this millennial generation um, is brought up to understand that they can change things and they want to be a part of it. So we, we cannot expect them not to be activists. And I think that's very positive. Now, that doesn't mean that problems, complex problems, are going to be solved because we come up with a hashtag. You know, we still need foreign policy to be smart, we still need democracy to work, we still need serious journalism, but the activism part, I believe, is a very positive one. We'll have a question over, over here. Uh, here we go, there's a mic microphone coming to you in a second. Thank you. Shelley Porges, Washington, D.C., National Finance Co-Chair for the Ready for Hillary PAC. You kind of foreshadowed my question, but I want to take, uh, go to the next <laughs> question. Anyway, and that is, you talk so much about people voting with their, you know, with their tweets and with their, you know, Facebook posts and whatever. Do you ever see a convergence, an actual convergence, 
of the social media voting and real voting, because not, notwithstanding the fact that we did in fact see increases in young people voting in 2008 and 2012, in the midterm elections and local elections and, and everywhere else, you know, it drops down again. We know that they're not, you know, they're not really getting out there. And it would be so important, such an incredible civic tool, if, if we could use the social media to actually, you know, start converging with voting. You know, we have the ID, you know, we have a way of validating IDs and so forth. So uh, what do you think about that? I'll give two very quick examples um, on the positive side. So same-sex marriage uh, would be one example where a conversation that has become much more real for millions of Americans because of Facebook and Twitter um, has turned into actionable policy across the United States. The second one is legalization of marijuana, which is another conversation that is incredibly active over social media and now turning into actionable policy. On the flip side, obviously 2014, um, midterm elections, the youth numbers are not looking good, uh, and hopefully there are a lot of people figuring out creative ways to engage that our generation in those conversations, uh, but it's difficult because the mistrust of older people and older institutions is so high that it, it's, it's hard to really get that connection. Okay, uh, question right over here. Hi, my name is Mark Um My question is about uh, validity versus speed. Um, I look at Fusion, it looks like it's a completely crowdsourced um, uh, panel or quilt, so maybe it's not a big issue, but I look at Vox and it looks like it's, it's an edited, curated stream of news. And so how do you go about validating and um, making decisions about what news sources to pull in um, even as you try to get it out faster and faster? Great question. Yeah, we have a, it's, a, it's an important question, and you know, we have a, so first of all, we have a, a, a rule in, the, in, in I think all of our seven brand newsrooms that uh, it's more important to be right than to be fast. Um, and having said that, both are important, because um, audiences demand both, but in that order. Um, and, uh, What's nice about, we talked about formats, what's nice about this medium is that unlike, say, again, broadcast or, or print before it, you can actually um, release something uh, after you know, some quick reporting to say, hey, we heard this um, and you know, we we're able to confirm this, but not that, and you can make something very short to inform your audience. And then you can go back, whether it's an hour or a day later, let's say it's five hours later, and say, okay, here's the news that we have. And then you can go back a day later and say, all right, we've done a lot of reporting, have a lot of perspective now, and do the longer thing. Um, and so you know, it becomes a situation where it's not either or. You can communicate transparently with the audience and use different formats for different situations because everything is unfolding. And if we're gonna be honest, the truth doesn't reveal itself sometimes ever, uh, and sometimes certainly uh, not for months or years. Um, so you, you have an obligation to reveal it as you uncover it. Let me just add, I'll be very quick, sure. just no. one data piece, which is, you know, with tools like, like Data Miner, it's, it, what, what essentially that lets a journalist do is, as we've deployed it is start their process earlier. So you made this good point about, you know, it's better to be right than quick. And our ambition and the tools that we would create would be enabling people to be right quicker, right? So ultimately, if they start six hours earlier, their process of validating and contextualizing, then ultimately, it's really the, the merging of what the best is in Twitter and, and, and the warning that can come from it with journalism. So maybe we crowdsource the pictures of a soccer game, but we are a very serious news organization and the fact that we are owned by Univision and, and, and by ABC News plays a big role uh, because although we, we want to be an unruly child of those two big <laughs> parents, we, <laughs> and we are, we are holding the same standards, rigor and practices that they do. And for us, investigative journalism is the most important part. Um, and, and I think that what, what we have uh, been able to understand is that uh, serious journalism doesn't need to be boring. 
Um, even when we go and do an investigation, like Pimp City, that if you go in and, and, check, and check it out, it took us a year, uh, but it's about uh, sex slaves and human trafficking. Uh, the way you present it, uh, the way that you can uh, show that that story is compelling and it has all the rigor and it has all the information there uh, can be done in a snackable, shareable, visual, interesting way uh, that, that you can um, uh, enjoy while you get informed. So um, I, I think that uh, it's very important that we are uh, really serious uh, well-run newsrooms, that we are incredibly responsible. Our job is to be the gatekeepers of all that um, fire hose, is that how you call yeah. it? Of all that fire hose and curating it to give you what is really relevant, what is true, and to add context. We spend a lot of time on this question because it's such an important one, and I'll just add that the beauty of a, of a live, public, widely distributed conversational platform is that while is that you can use that same open platform to verify what Jim was saying is so important and we see news organizations uh, all the good ones including those here across the board do it which is to in a public way pull back the curtain and ask the questions and find the sources and dig to verify and to, and to reveal to the audience here's what we know here's what we don't know it really is a, a democratization of, of journalism I think we've time for just a couple more questions I'll right here um, in the front in the white my name is Allison Ross. I have a question about what gets into the fire hose. Do you worry that the fire hose becomes in some way saturated with the youngest, the tech savviest, who are filling the fire hose? And how do we make sure that we're covering everything if our main source Participate. shifts? Participate. Yeah. Well, I'm talking about people who don't participate in Twitter, for instance, older people, people who aren't as connected in the mobile way. Well, I, I mean, I can add one thing from a, from a data perspective, is that you know, if you think of a, a data set like Twitter, one of the most interesting things about it is that it skews towards what people find very interesting and very unusual in real time. So for example, if a real world event happens in a, in a place where there isn't even a lot of tweeting activity, that's actually a time that statistically there is a lot of tweeting activity. Um, because of the abnormality of what they're seeing. So it actually is a data set which you know, skews towards coverage of interesting things because as you self-define yourself publicly for your followers, you are in some regards making content and want to make content that's interesting. So I mean that certainly doesn't solve what, what you're talking about. It is skewed. There are dem some demographics or some countries that are more well uh, represented than others. But what we found looking at the data and, and, and you know, looking at the archive, the fossils of everything that's happened, is that it skews very well towards things that actually are important, and that's one of the best qualities about it. Yes, question over here. Christy Fair, Vitacom, New York. Hi, Christy. Um, I'm just curious, what are the um, statistics on uh, uh, people watching videos clicks? Will they click for a video before a click for an article? Um, I'm just very confused about how really popular video is. Do they have the patience for video? Do you mean on Twitter or do you mean in on, general on, on the web? On any platform. Okay, I mean, we are finding in my business that yeah. the video, uh, the, that the ratio of clicking on videos is not instant enough for them. Yeah. People want pictures, they want it fast. Do you have any evidence that video is gonna overtake this? I, I, I'd say, you know, video is, it, it, it's funny, I always get uncomfortable talking about the popularity of one media type over another, a photo <laughs> versus a moving picture versus mm -hmm. a printed word. Uh, it, 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 they're all critical to the storytelling process. Having said that, video is taking off by every conceivable statistic and it's probably growing faster than the others, uh, and it's growing faster on mobile than the others. And you bring up an important point, though, because because of that, and because, honestly, if you look at the economics behind the business that we're in, um, there's an imperative to create more video views because there's a lot of advertiser demand for it. I'd encourage you all to Google. There's a funny story. 
uh, a, a parody story in The Onion about a, a CEO like, like us who demands more web video from their team and his team and takes out an ax running around the office like a madman <laughs> saying more web video. I, I, I think that you know, the, the point of it is that you can't, to your point too, you can't just create video if that's not the right mechanism to tell the story. Um, video, sound, sight, motion is a very, obviously a very powerful mechanism for storytelling, but when a 500 word or a 50 word article will do, you're right, like why sit through that? Why consume the data on your cell phone plan, which is actually pretty expensive, when you can just go to a website and do it? You know, I use an example of fantasy football, uh, which you know, for those of you who don't play, you know, you, you try to get information about which football players are gonna be the best on your team. To sit through a video to get that information is ridiculous when you can just go to an article. Having said that, when you're trying to tell an expressive story um, and, you know, see the, the emotion in someone's face when you interview them, and, you know, so there, that's important. So there are different uses for different things and it's critical to do it for the right reasons. And that's part of what a good storyteller, a good journalist, a good producer can help figure out. Yeah. Well, we are actually, unfortunately, out of time. But I will, uh, I will wrap by telling you that um, our selfie generated uh, 70 retweets, 25 favorites, and I will tweet later the number of impressions. This is no doubt millions and millions of impressions, and we'll see if it's had any impact on any reporting. So I'll let you know on Twitter. Thank you so much to my panelists and to everybody.